question. Do you read your kiddos a bedtime story each night? Mine get into their PJs and I snuggle up with them and read to them every night. It is such a lovely way to help them wind down from the day. Currently, the books they always ask for feature them in the story, which they find mind-blowingly exciting. My best book have a big range of personalised books written for curious children that love to explore. In one book, they could be having an underwater adventure and in another, they could be on a super safari. You can also buy personalised books which focus on big life transitions. We have one about giving dummies to the dummy elf, which we need to do according to the dentist. And we have another about starting school. My three-year-olds love seeing themselves in the stories. They get totally involved and they point out the things that they're doing on each page. I'm crossing my fingers and hoping that these books will make these tricky life transitions a bit smoother. It's so easy to order my best book. Simply head to mybestbook.uk, type in your child's name and a few details like hair and skin colour and within minutes you'll have a personalised book coming your way. You can get 20% off your order with the code NOTANOTHERMUMMY22. Welcome back to Not Another Mummy podcast with me, Alison Perry. What happens when your whole life is turned upside down by your long-term relationship ending and having to explore your identity all while looking after three kids? My guest today, Laura Friedman-Williams, talks about her experience of this in her book, Available, a memoir of sex and dating after a marriage ends. When Laura's husband of 27 years left her and their three children for another woman, she had to learn to navigate the dating world once again. A little encouragement from her friends and one astonishing one night stand later, she realised that she had a sexual appetite that she'd never explored and that being a mother didn't mean that she had to ignore it. She discovered that she could be independent, a good mum and have a great sex life all at the same time. Laura also had to learn how to have open and honest discussions with her children about her dating life without alienating or embarrassing them. It was brilliant to talk to Laura and a word of warning, we do talk frankly about dating and sex so you might not want to listen to this in the car on the school run. Laura, a huge welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited. I love speaking to people who have accents that are different than my own. (laughs) You can't really get much more different, can you, than uh, British and American? (laughs) I love it. It makes me so happy. Um, Now, tell us where you are right now and what your day has been like so far. Okay, I'm in New York City, um, and which is where I live, and it's been a very hectic morning already. It's 10 o'clock here. Got up super early, took my daughter to school, did some errands, picked up bread, ate half a loaf of it already by myself, um, had lots of coffee, so I'm ready to go. Good, 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 good. Okay, brilliant. I love, I just love the idea of you being in New York in the morning, going to get bread. It's just a, a million miles away from me at 3 p.m. Um, in Bromley in England, waiting for my eldest <laughs> daughter to come home from school. My two, my, my, my toddler twins downstairs. I'm just like praying that they keep quiet down there and don't, you know, wow. scream and shout. So it's just oh like my pulls apart, but it's all good. It's yes, all good. definitely. <laughs> um, now, um, your book is described as an honest account of life after divorce. Um, how would you describe the accounts of divorce are out there already. Do you see them as being unrealistic or cliched? I think a lot of times what they do is they focus on one aspect or the other. So it's either about how miserable and hard divorce is, <clears throat> which is true, it is, um, or it's about, thank God that marriage is behind me, now I'm living my best life. And that's true too. So I think when um, I say that mine is very honest, it's because it really presents both. There's a lot of heartbreak, um, and it continues, but there's also great strides forward and great feelings of liberation and a new life that I wouldn't have had otherwise. So both sides are very true, often in the same hour, in the same day. You know, they don't, they, they coexist very comfortably together, so sometimes very uncomfortably, but it's not all one way or the other. And I think a lot of times when people frame divorce, you know, they have a very strong point of view that it's one or the other. And, um, in my experience, it's, it's really 
both all the time. Yeah. Uh, So tell me what life was like for you before your marriage ended. Um, My life was very stable and and pretty lovely. I I thought I had a really um, sort of enviable life. I had three kids that are spread apart, like like you, I had a big age difference um, with my children. So they're spread over about 11 years, three kids. And we live in, we just moved into a beautiful apartment in New York that was finally big enough to accommodate all of us. And I thought that's where we would stay forever. Uh, we put a lot of time and, and heart into that home. And my husband and I had met in college. So we had been together already for 27 years and we were very settled um, he worked really hard. I was a stay home mom. Um, I, I was always doing some kind of volunteer effort at the kids schools. I was PTA president many times and running auctions and book fairs, and bake sales. And I loved it. I loved doing that. I loved being home with my kids. I loved my circle of friends. I loved the safety and the security of my life. And then you found out, didn't you, out of the blue, that your husband was being unfaithful. Tell me about that. Um, I did. It was, <clears throat> it was largely out of the blue, although the few, for a few months I'd been, I, I just had a very, um, foreboding sense that something was off between us in a way that was different than any other time in our life before that. As I said, we'd been together for a long time and knew each other quite well. And it, it was, he, there was a certain hostility and aloofness to him that was so not who he was. He was always the friendliest, most loving, outgoing person. And I saw this side of him and I couldn't pinpoint the source of it. Um, And this went on for a few months and I was really begging him to talk to me. I couldn't understand what was happening. And finally, I was so desperate that I looked in his phone, um, which is not something I ever would have imagined I would do. I'm not a jealous person. I, he has many friendships with women. He works, he has his own business. He works with women very closely. I never thought, I never thought at all that he might have an affair. It never even occurred to me. But I looked in his phone and I found uh, the evidence that he was. And I felt like my, just my whole world was over. Like everything I understood about my world uh, ended that night. Um, and I felt completely decimated by it, by the news, not just because he had been unfaithful and because I wasn't sure what would happen to our marriage, but because I felt that I had never understood our marriage. I felt suddenly like I had never understood anything that what I thought I saw or what I thought I felt was so one-sided and sort of tunnel visioned that I had been uh, sort of sleeping through my life. Mm. Um, and that really scared me. Yeah, I can imagine that kind of thing just really rocking you and making you doubt everything. Yeah, you doubt everything. Because you think, you know, here I am walking through my days thinking, what a lovely life I have. I have a husband who adores me. We have these three children. One of them is going to go off to college next year, but we still have the little one home. I just moved into my forever home. I have my country house. My parents are alive and healthy. I have such a good life. I'm happy. And I would walk around my days feeling content and peaceful that way. And so for me to acknowledge all that time, he was slowly dying inside. In his mind, this marriage was like a prison that he had to, you know, get out of to see what else life could look like. I just couldn't understand how we could have two points of view. And this was the person who I felt loved me and knew me more than anybody in the world. So how how did I make, how could I make sense of myself if the person I love the most didn't share that perspective with me in any way? Yeah. Yeah. And you say in your book that you'd always thought that infidelity is something that you could forgive, but that wasn't the case in the end, was it? No, I guess I thought hypothetically, you know, when we think about things that haven't happened to us, but we think what we could, what we would do in certain cases like that. I thought of infidelity, I think, really as a physical, um, you know, betrayal, as a physical betrayal. And I could get over physical betrayal. To me, it it didn't feel like when I thought about it, I thought, okay, so, you know, my husband's on on a business trip and he maybe has a drink too many and he gets carried away and he can't stop himself and he ends up having sex with another woman. This is not ideal. Um, This is not something I would be, like, you know, happy to know, but I felt like, okay, I mean, big deal. I I could get over that. I, what I didn't ever think about was what if my husband fell in love with another woman? 
And that was something totally different. The idea that what he was supposed to be giving just to me uh, in a very emotional way, that he could give that to another woman, that betrayal felt the worst. I didn't, I never had thought about this term like an emotional affair. Um, and I've thought about it a lot since because in the beginning he didn't, he wouldn't admit that he had had an affair with this woman. And I said, well, at least you can admit that you crossed the line emotionally. We can agree on that. And he said, yes. And for me, that was the part I couldn't see coming that I couldn't forgive. And, um, your children, am I right in thinking that your children were, were they 17, 14 and six at the time? Yes. Very good. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm very good at maths. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm impressed. Um, how did how did the split affect them? It must have been major in their lives at that age. Yeah, it was brutal. I, I, it makes me still. It's been four years, and it still is hard for me to think about without feeling sad or guilty that I couldn't do better for them. Um, they, the older ones, they knew right away what happened. I, I, I couldn't keep it a secret from them. I was living in the house alone with them. My husband had moved out within 48 hours. He was gone and I was home alone with them. <clears throat> and I was trying to make it seem like he was away on for work, but they, they're smart kids and they know me well. So they, they could see that something was off. So I told, I, I told them that we were separating, that we needed some time. And they immediately said, well, then someone's having an affair. This makes no sense. Um, so they knew and they were distraught, you know, their father, especially for my son, who was the 14 year old, his father was really on a pedestal for him. He really, um, idolized him. And this was a complete fall from grace. And my son is a very, he's, he's very loyal. So for him, it was like, okay, dad's always been my, my person, but now dad is dead to me. Oh. And, um, it's all about mom. And he didn't speak to my husband for 10 years for 10 months, 10 months. He didn't speak to him. And in the life of a 14 year old, you know, that was a pretty traumatic shakeup for all of us. Um, and then the youngest one, my daughter, she was just so sad. You know, she would just wake up crying and she was such a happy, easygoing, loving, resilient child. And to see her sad, just absolutely destroyed me. And she would say, is it, has it been long enough? Can you and daddy make up now? Can daddy come home? And I could just kept thinking from her perspective, it was like she went to bed one night, her father was gone the next day and he never came back. Uh, and so, and, and when she spent time with him, then it was always just her and him because the other kids wouldn't see him. So it felt like we'd been this really close, uh, family. We did a lot of things together. We had our country house that we would go up to on weekends and we traveled and we would have dinners together. And then we just had fall, then we fell apart just spectacularly fell apart. So there must have been a lot of healing and almost recalibrating that went on in that period. But after the dust had settled a bit, uh, what was the first moment that you thought, hmm, maybe I could dip my toe into dating and, you know, almost like your eyes were opened to the possibility of other men in your life? Yeah, that was, I mean, that was a pretty like seismic shift for me. It didn't happen gradually. I really wasn't thinking about doing anything outside of my house because I always had a child home with me Um, because the older kids weren't seeing their dad. They were usually with me. And if they weren't, then I had, you know, a, a six-year-old with me. So, um, it, it didn't even occur to me. I, I felt very lonely, broken and sad. I, I didn't, I couldn't think about moving forward. And, um, I happened to be alone one night and I was in my bedroom with the door closed because my husband was with my daughter in another part of the house. And I just thought, wow, I am, I'm trapped here. And everybody else in my family is now off living their lives. Even my kids, they're grieving, but they're still doing whatever they're doing. It was summer, they were at camp or traveling. I don't remember where they were, but they're off doing their thing. And I'm now going to be the one who just stays um, in this sort of suppressed state. So I went out. I just went out by myself. I got dressed and I went to a bar in town. And that was really the first time I thought that I might even date or see what life was like. It hadn't occurred to me until that moment. And then there I was by myself on a Saturday night, you know, in a strapless dress waiting to be seen. 
it was pretty weird. <laughs> it's funny though, isn't it? Because, um, you know, I, I, I chat to a lot of friends, you know, who've gone through separations and divorces. And the thing that always strikes me as being like a, a big plus point, if you can call anything <laughs> in divorce or separation a plus point, is the fact that you, so many people have time to themselves because, you know, the kids go off, you know, whether it's every weekend or every second weekend, and they have this time where they can go and you know, do the things that make them happy. But for yeah. what you're describing, you know, with your older two not wanting to go off and spend time with their dad and with having such a young child as well, that must have been really hard not to have that space that that is afforded to so many people after separation. Yeah. And I did come to you. You're, you're absolutely right. I, I came to get that space, you know, because then my kids were old enough. My daughter went off to college. My my son became much more independent and was doing his own thing. And it, over time, the youngest one did start spending more time with her dad. So I came to have that that time. But that first year, I didn't have it at all. So even if I had a pocket of time, like two hours, I would make the most of it. I started to get almost frantic. Like, okay, I have, I knew, for example, if my daughter was with my ex-husband, uh, my son would sleep late. He was a teenager. So I think, okay, I have until like early afternoon before anyone's going to see me. What can I do this morning? And I would make arrangements, you know, to meet men for coffee or have dates. And, and I, I would just, I was like, a, I was working frantically because once I had a taste of it, I wanted more of it, but I didn't want to take away from my time with my children. So it was this like fine balancing act of, I see the future that can be mine. I need it because it's, it's giving me a lifeline, but I, my, I can't let the children know I'm doing this because I just need to be there for them right now. They're, they have to feel that they are absolutely my focal point. So it was a very fine balancing act between finding a little time on my own. And I would say I did it by the hour. You know, it wasn't like I would find days to myself. I literally would do it like I've got a little time, but move fast. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> now your book is filled with stories um, of your dating journey. What are some of the highlights and lowlights? Well, the highlight, I think, you know, the, the, the biggest highlight was the first time. Um, I often say, I wish I could go back and have that first time again. It was so amazing because I had forgotten how wonderful sex could be and what it felt like to be seen by somebody for the first time. So, you know, here I'd been with the same man since I was 20 years old and now I'm 47 and I meet this man in a bar and I, I was so forward. I basically just suggested that he take me back to his hotel room, um, and have sex with me. And I, I don't know where it came from. I don't know where the boldness came from. If it came from desperation or from my, you know, sort of play acting, what I thought somebody might do, but I just really knew I needed to knock it out. I needed to have sex for the first time and see what that was like. And it was so amazing because I felt like this man was seeing my body and, and, and even just who I was as a person in a way that was different than anybody had seen me for years. Um, you know, I felt like I had become so like, here I am, I'm, I'm a stay home mom. I'm the mother of your children. I'm the wife. I'm the one who makes the doctor's appointments. I'm the one who makes dinner. I'm the one who cleans up. I scrape the toothpaste out of the sink. And then now there's this man who sees nothing but my body, which he's very complimentary of. Um, and only wants more of it. Didn't he give you, just, didn't he give you a really, really big compliment while you were having sex? <laughs> he did. Well, he, yes, he told me that, um, I had, am I allowed to say? You can say no, what you like. On the show? Okay. He, he told me, he, he sort of went down on me and then said, you have a really nice pussy. And I laughed. I just cackled. I couldn't believe somebody would say that. He couldn't, he didn't know why it was funny. And I, I hadn't, I don't know. I don't think I'd yet told him that it was my first time, you know, having sex with another man that wasn't my husband in 27 years. So I just started laughing and I said, I'm so sorry. That's so nice. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I just didn't know that people talked like that. And so, and I was so embarrassed because I thought, oh my God, like people use this language. Like, does he think I need to hear this? Now I understand people just use that language. I mean, many people do now. And, and I'm, I'm, I've gotten to a place where I can say it comfortably without, you know, turning 18 shades of red. <laughs> so anyway, th I would say that was the highlight because for me, when that night was over, it was like somebody had just turned me back on again. You know, I had been in a very dormant state and somebody plugged me back in and I came roaring back to life. And I was like, I want more of that. I felt alive. I felt good. I felt joyful. And I felt like I had been given something 
that I wouldn't have had if I had stayed in my marriage. It felt like the first time that I could see something that was a positive um, was just having that sort of reintroduction to sexuality, to my body, to what I was like as a woman, not just as a wife and a mother, but as a woman. Mm-hmm. So that that was really, um, that, I think that will always be the highlight for me. It was like, it was such a turning point. Um, the low light, unfortunately, was sort of the opposite of that, which was that as if what I felt after that night was I felt empowered and sexual um, and independent. And when <clears throat> I had uh, my first online dating experience, I met this man um, and we met out in the, you know, like in the neighborhood. And then he suggested I go back to his house for coffee. And I really didn't want to. I didn't get a great vibe from him. And I felt weird. I felt like, why Why would I go back to your house? We just met. And I thought we were going to have coffee like at a cafe. I mean, even though I was pretty easy, like, you know, I, I didn't have, I mean, I would sleep with people pretty quickly at this point. I was really sowing my wild oats. I still like to know people first and decide whether or not I was interested in them. It wasn't like so transactional for me. Um, so I went back to his house reluctantly and he just made like moves on me super quickly. And I didn't want to have sex with him. I felt like I wasn't ready to, I didn't know him. I didn't really, wasn't really attracted to him. And I felt really trapped and I slept with him even though I didn't want to. And it felt really icky to me. It was scary. I felt like I just gave something away. I felt the opposite of empowered. I felt weak. I felt taken advantage of. I was furious at myself that I would be in such a position. I knowing that, for example, if a friend or one of my children had told me that they went into some man's apartment that they did not know because they didn't know how to say no, I would have been furious. So I was, I left that day and I was very, um, disgusted with him, disgusted with myself. And it was really the first time in my new life as this very like sexual free woman, seeing sex as a, as a negative, as a, as a, something that you could use to hurt somebody, um, or that you could use to hurt yourself if you weren't careful about it and didn't act empowered. If I kept acting like a woman who didn't know how to say no, because I was afraid that I would not please somebody that was like such a vestige from my old life. So I, it was a terrible experience. Um, and I was, I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell any of my friends. I couldn't talk about it. I was so ashamed. And that was the other thing was that that sexual experience brought shame into my new life for the first time. Um, and that was a terrible feeling. So I was, in some ways I was grateful for it later because it did teach me a lot. And also it made me very clear about how I needed to take care of myself and do things only that I wanted to do and that I needed to call the shots for myself. But, um, it was, it was not, in the moment, it was a real learning experience that was, it was painful. I guess that's the thing, isn't it? Is that, you know, in any, any new experience in life or any new sort of stage in life, we, we do have to go through this learning experience. It's yeah. just unfortunate, like you say, that it, it kind of brought you so much shame and discomfort and, um, and pain. So it, it's, it's interesting hearing you talking about, you know, that the highlight, the first time that you had sex, um, post, post marriage, hearing that difference in language. Um, yeah. you know, you must have noticed that big shift in how people date now compared to back then, back before you were married. You know, so many trends have been and gone, whether it's, I guess, thinking through the years, like speed dating and internet dating yes. and using apps to kind of hook up with people. Um, where did you even begin to start when it came to meeting men? Well, that first night I got lucky, right? Because I just went out by myself and thought, oh, I'm going to meet somebody and um, I'm going to flirt with somebody at a bar tonight. Like That was my big goal. And then when I got to the bar and saw that everybody was actually old, like everybody there had white <laughs> hair or no hair, and everybody was coupled off, I thought, wow, I really am so out of it. I, ha- I have no idea how this is done. I haven't done this ever. It wasn't just that I hadn't done it in 27 years. I had never done it. You know, the last time I dated, I was um, in college. So I was going to fraternity parties with my girlfriends. And that's how I met guys, you know, or, or like my the, the man I ended up marrying was my next door neighbor in my second year of college. He was my neighbor and we became friends. Um, so I had never done this kind of like going out 
you know, and looking for men situation. Um, so that first night I was, I mean, when, when I found somebody who was, um, young, tall, had a full head of hair that was, you know, not gray, I was like, whoa, jackpot. That was a once in a lifetime experience. That was the universe sending you a sign that you need to keep moving forward. But I, then I had no idea what to do with myself after that. I like just wanted more of it, but I didn't know how to get it. And I didn't want to go online because I was scared that my husband would see me online or somebody would see me and I would just feel really uncomfortable about it. So I ended up the next person I met, I met at the, like this little health food store where my daughter was going to camp. It was somebody I knew, somebody who had done some work for me in my house before. And I bumped into him and I, and I sort of choked out that, um, my husband and I'd split up because he knew us and we ended up, he took me out for a drink and I ended up, um, sleeping with him. And after that, it was either I went, the next one I went to a bar, a friend set me up with somebody that she had her eye on at the gym, but she was married. So she couldn't have him. So she decided I should. (laughs) Um, and then I got into online dating. Um, and that was like a whole new world uh, in, in, in and of itself. So for me, it wasn't just that it was that times had changed. It was that I was also in midlife, which changes everything, you know, in terms of the way that you approach the world, the way you see yourself, the way you fit into the world. Um, trends had changed, but I, I don't even know that I thought so much like, oh, trends have changed as much as I don't think I knew what I was doing to begin with. Like one of the things that I, I was really, um, like really surprised me was about wa- waxing and hair removal. Men, um, like my experience in this, in, in this new world of dating is that men love women to be completely bare. And a lot of men brought it up with me and I was so offended. Like, I don't have, I mean, I'm, I'm keeping it maintained. It's not like I've got this like huge bush. So I can't believe this is offensive to anybody but it was, they wanted it to be bare. And then I felt so bad for my husband because I thought, oh my God, like I really just, I I didn't do anything for him. So that was, there there were some surprises like that, you know, that were just, uh, whether it's a trend or it's a midlife thing, it was hard for me to know what was, you know, what was one thing versus the other. Yeah, that makes absolute sense. Yeah. Um, And for you, it was definitely about having fun and having sex, wasn't it? Rather than meeting a future partner. Oh, a hundred percent. I, because I wasn't even sure that my husband and I weren't going to get back together. You know, there was, um, we were, we were in couples therapy. We weren't living together and we were in couples therapy and we were trying to decide if, if we might be able to, um, come back together. And it never really felt like we would. I don't think that we ever got close to a place where we really talked about it seriously because it felt like the divide was so extreme for us that, once that, that happened, um, I just could never look at him the same way again. And I also understood that he wanted something different out of marriage than, than what I seemed to want. So it, it was really never going to be a possibility. So the, the, the dating for me and the sex was really more of a sort of journey, a, a fact finding mission. I wasn't looking for a relationship. I did not want a relationship. I wanted to just see what was out there. I wanted to see what life was like. I wanted to see what it felt like to be single, to live on my own, to be independent. Um, I wanted to see what men were like. I wanted to see what it was like to be with someone who was, you know, really creative versus someone who was really buttoned up and serious or someone who had kids or someone who had never been married. Like there were so many, there were so many kinds of people. And I felt so free to date any of them because I wasn't looking for a partner. I wasn't looking for a future father of my children. I wasn't looking to intertwine my life with somebody I just wanted, I just wanted to like figure out who I was and what I wanted. So it was very liberating. It was like, it's a great way to date because you're not looking for anything. You're just sort of putting yourself out there to see what happens. Yeah. And I love the way that you um, describe that contrast between single, sexy woman, you know, and 40 something mother. You know, you you talk about giving um, a ride to a man in your car and having to sweep the car seat from all the snacks. (laughs) That your your daughter had been eating on a journey. Um, you know, yeah. Did you feel, at, 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 you know, at the start at least, that you couldn't be both of those things at the same time? Yeah, a hundred percent. And I still feel that way. It's still it's still strange. You know, I, I know so many people get married again, or live with people, or incorporate new partners into their lives. And um, I don't want to. I haven't wanted to. I, I have been dating someone, um, the man in the book who is comes 
sixth in line, number six. Um, I, I'm still dating him. It's been three years and he's met my children and he knows them, but I really don't in, in have him over very much when the kids are around. My life with my kids is really my time with my kids. My life with him is my, my time with him. That's it. They're, they're like, it's like a real separation of church and state because I still find it hard to do both at the same time. And not only do I find hard, I just don't want to. I think I feel when I'm with my children, I want to give them a hundred percent. I still feel very guilty that they're grappling with, you know, all of the aftermath of a divorced family where they have to go back and forth um, between houses where, you know, they're not sure like who, who they're going to see on a holiday or if somebody's girlfriend or boyfriend is going to be there when they come over. And if that's uncomfortable for them, I, I still grapple with all of that. So I want to be very um, pure when I'm with them. They just get me. They don't have to deal with all of the mishigas of my new life. They just get me. And um, that's not true with their dad. Their, their dad's girlfriend is around a lot more and that's hard for them. It's not because they don't like her. It's just that they want him to themselves. And so sometimes I feel like I'm indulging them, you know, that I'm, that I should sort of be like, listen, that was then, and this is now, and this is how it is now. And we have to acclimate to this, but I, there's no need to, you know, I don't want to be married again. I, I've never lived alone my entire life and I'm trying to just be here now and not really worry about what comes next. Um, and, and so I don't know, it's, it's hard to be, I think it depends also now that I've been with somebody for a few years, you know, we're a little bit more settled. We know each other's friends and family, and it's not like the crazy newness of, of a new relationship where you're having sex five times a day and, you know, walking around naked like that, that, um, unfortunately <laughs> that doesn't last forever, sadly. <laughs> um, so I don't know. In the beginning, especially, I found that very hard. I would never want my kids to see that side of me. I own, I really just want them to know me as their mom. Yeah. Um, so, at what know. point did um? Well, at what point did your kids know that you were dating again? Because that must have been quite a weird thing to begin with. Ugh, it was so awkward. Um, well, I didn't. The first person who knew was my son because he was living with me. My daughter had gone off to college, and my younger daughter, you know, on the weekends. She, she was with her dad. And so that's when I would have like one night a week, like a Saturday night, I would be free. And he was doing his own thing. He was with his friends and I was going out. And one night he said, you know, where are you going? Are you going out with your friends? And I said, no. And he said, so where are you going? And I said, well, I'm, I, I've been meaning to tell you, I want to tell you, but like, don't tell your sisters. Um, I'm not ready to share this, but I'm, I'm dating. I, ne I need to see who's out there. I need to see what kind of people are out there. And I, I over-explained to myself. I don't think I stopped <laughs> speaking for like 20 minutes. You know, the words were just tumbling out. And he goes, okay, Ma, you go, you do you. Go, go live your life. <laughs> and and um, I don't think he, uh, he couldn't get rid of me fast enough. You know, he like his eyes never left the TV he was watching when I said this. And I said, can we talk about this for a second? Are you upset? And he said, no, I'm not upset. I understand. And, um, you know, I didn't tell him the details ever. I would just say I have a date or this is where I'm going on a date. And, uh, when my daughter came home for Thanksgiving, so that was in November. So it had been almost a year, about 10 months since my husband and I split up. She walked in uh, to my bedroom late one night and I was on the phone with number six and she asked who I was talking to. And I, I couldn't come up with a lie fast enough. And so, um, I told her that I was talking to somebody that I was dating and she was furious. I mean, a, a kind of rage that was like the kind of rage I felt at my husband when I found out he was having an affair. In my daughter's eyes, I was like cheating on the whole family. This was too soon. She wasn't ready for it. I had been lying because I hadn't told her. Uh, I didn't keep things from her. So why would I keep this? If I was keeping it, it must be because I knew I was doing something wrong. And she was so hurt angry and hurt. And I was angry and hurt too, because I felt like, what do you want me to do? This was not my doing. And I'm trying to catch up to my life now. I'm trying to live. I'm trying to figure out what's next for me. This is not easy. And she, you know, she's, she was a, she's a teenager. She was like, I don't really care about any of that. I care about my place in this family and like, you're my mom. And that's all you need to be. All you need to be is our mother. You don't need to worry about anything else. We just need you here with us. And I understood how scared she was of losing me. 
but I, it didn't stop me from being scared that I was never going to be able to have both a relationship or any kind of a dating life and be a great mom, you know, be the kind of dedicated mom I had been. Yeah. So then what happened? What, what changed to get to the point where, you know, the, your, your daughter was happy with, with the fact that you were dating and, and you felt more comfortable with talking about it? I think just time, you know, I think it was just about the passage of time and, and understanding um, that her dad and I were not going to get back together. I think she had to accept that. She had to really accept that. Um, and it was the hardest for her for whatever reason, uh, more so than for the other kids. And I think as, as time went on and she saw that I didn't really tell her about my dating. I, I think that I would tell her, you know, once in a while, like, oh, I'm going over to, you know, number sixes. I didn't call him that. I called him by name, but I'm <laughs> going over there or, you know, is that okay? And and sometimes it wasn't, you know, even I remember her coming home from college and it being, you know, her last night at home, but it was my one free night, maybe in a week. And so I would go out to dinner with him and then she would be furious at me that I hadn't spent the night with her. So there was the constant readjustments for me and for her to say, like, how much can I loosen the reins and what do I want here? Um, it really was just time. I think it took, I'm trying to remember, I think it was like a year ago that she, number six, made dinner for her. Um, and she came over for dinner and that was the first time she met him. So it took a long time. It was, it was a very, very slow process. And I think that she is very nice to, you know, when she sees him, she's very pleasant and friendly, but I'm not trying to, for them to have a relationship. I think what was harder for my kids and what really forced the conversation more so than my dating was my writing about the dating, because it was very easy for me to keep my dating life um, quiet. Even if, I mean, the worst thing that had happened was that my daughter walked in on me when I was on the phone with him, you know, that had been like the worst thing that had happened so far, or that I had to this terribly awkward conversation with my son, where I said that I was going out on a date and I'd be back late. But that was the extent to which they knew my dating life. They didn't ask me any questions and I didn't share any details, but then I wrote a book about it. And I, in the book, I was graphic and I detailed every man I had sex with. And some of these were men that they knew so I had to come clean about a lot of it. And that's when the really, truly awkward conversations uh, came. How did you navigate those conversations? Honestly, I like could, I, I want to crawl under a desk right now just thinking about how awkward it was. It was just, there was one particular moment that was so awful. Um, I With my son, again, because he and I were living most, a lot of the time it was just the two of us. And so he knew that I was working on something and finally I just told him what it was. And he did the same, you know, you do you, mom. He's very, uh, he's the most laid back, happy, chill person. And that was such a gift for me because it was very easy to navigate. Um, you know, he just really wanted me to be happy. And I think also he didn't want me to be alone. He wanted to know that he could go out on a Saturday night and not worry about me sitting home by myself. So that was, you know, when I started telling him about it, he was sort of like, okay, this is kind of weird, but like, eh, it's your life. You live your life. You know, with my daughter, there, there'd been this man, she didn't know most of the people. So I felt like I could just sort of tell her the large brush strokes of what I was writing about. And, um, there was this one man that I, it was the last person I slept with in, in, as part of this book. And he was somebody that was at a resort. He was like the guy that sold, um, like fruit and weed. Uh, and he was like a, I mean, he was the most handsome, beautiful man I'd ever seen. And we would go to this resort every year on vacation. And my daughter and I would go and flirt with him and joke about who he was looking at. Like, it was a total joke. It was, it sounds icky, but it was really just a funny thing. Like, oh my God, he's so handsome. Is he more interested in you because you're young or me because I'm older and wiser? And I ended up going back to this place and I, um, and I slept with him and I had to tell her because I felt, sure, oh, I hear, I hear children. Did you hear that? <laughs> yeah, that was, a, that was a piercing scream. Oh, that's nothing. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I love those sounds, especially because they're not in my house. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> um, so I had to tell her, I had to tell her because I knew that that could come out in the book and that would be something you should know. And she was disgusted. She actually said to me, I'm just disgusted. I can't even look at you. And I, I felt really bad for her, but I was also like, but why? I mean, why should you be disgusted with me? I'm not married. Um, I'm, I'm available. 
And I'm a sexual woman and I am putting myself out there and I feel no shame about having sex. I'm not going to apologize to anyone and I'm not going to apologize to you because I'm not doing any of this to hurt you. And this is really not about you. And you're getting old enough to realize that this is not about you. And so those were really painful conversations. To her credit, she would get furious at me and then she would move on. Um, she does not like to, she gets very angry. She's very quick to anger, but then she doesn't like to be angry. She wants to let it go. So we would, ha- we had a lot of really painful conversations about, well, you know, she thinks sex should be much more private. She's a little bit more buttoned up and a little bit more prudish about it. She doesn't think it's something that you need to go have sex with whoever you want, mom, but you don't need to write about it and tell the world about it. And I, I said, well, I do apparently. And that's my choice, you know, and I feel also that when you do these things, when you talk about them, you release the shame. And for me, there was so much guilt and shame and I'm still, you know, I still work my way through that. And I, and I don't want that to be true for my children. I don't want them to feel shame about their sex lives. And for me to have this burgeoning sexuality against the backdrop of my children coming into their own sexuality was quite interesting. Yeah. That must have been really interesting, actually, because you must have been having conversations with them, like like every parent does, about sex and about staying safe and about being sensible, I guess, you know, when, when they're yeah. dating themselves. So um, did that make it easier or harder? Because I can imagine some children might almost like throw stuff back in their parents' face. Like, you can't tell me to do this when you're off doing X, Y, Z. Right. Yeah. I think they didn't know enough about what I was doing. They felt that I was sort of, I think my daughter felt that I was being a bit promiscuous, which is kind of funny. I mean, just when the tables are turned. But I also explained to her, like, your father was the third person I slept with in my life. And that was, that's all I've really ever known. So this is, I'm, I'm finding myself too. And sex in my midlife is very different. And what I said to all of them is everybody wants to have sex. Everybody likes having sex. Empires, presidencies, you know, celebrities, et cetera, have been brought down. Governments have been brought down because people had sex with the wrong people, um, or at the wrong time. And so I, I'm not going to approach it like this is something that I'm sneaking in on the side or that I shouldn't be doing. I am not married anymore. It wasn't my choice not to be married anymore. I wanted to marry to your father forever. And now here I am. And I'm making the most of my life in this new stage. And I'm doing it carefully and I'm doing it respectfully. And none of you are being really influenced by it on a day-to-day basis. So I think, you know, for my son, who, who at one point I said to him, as the book, once I got a book deal and I was writing the book and it was coming closer to coming out, I said to him, I'm sorry if this book embarrassed you. And he said, you know, it did embarrass me in the beginning. It seemed a little embarrassing, but I'm over it. I, I'm just proud of you now. That's all I feel. Aww, that's so and, good. Yeah. And even my daughter, you know, who's a tough cookie and she's turning 22 soon, very soon. So, you know, she's a grown up now. Um, she, on the, on the day that I, that my book was published, she put something on her Instagram account saying, um, congratulations to my always embarrassing, but iconic mother. Aww. And I felt like, yes, That's we've made peace. Good. <laughs> That's as good I'll as it's going to get. It. <laughs> well, she also wrote like, here's the book that I begged my mother not to write. So, uh, <laughs> she never, she's never going to let me off easily. And the, and the little one is so funny. She's so free and she really is, she's so influenced by having such older siblings and being, living in a very adult world. So even though she's like a tween and she's just sort of starting to, you know, dip her toes in the water of, you know, talking about who likes who and, you know, wanting to put a little mascara on in the mornings, which I'm still not letting her, you know, all (laughs) that. She, um, came home from school, one of her first days of of middle school, her new school and said, um, I told my teacher that you published a book and she wants you to come in and talk to the class about the publishing (laughs) process. (laughs) At least it's the publishing process, not the actual content of the book. (laughs) The content. And I said, well, did you tell her what the book was about? And she looked at me and she said, I just told her it wasn't for children. (laughs) (laughs) But she feels no, she's not embarrassed at all. She's really like proud of me. You know, she'll tell her friends, like my mom wrote a book. In fact, recently um, a mother said to me, I heard, I heard that your book was um, published in Bangladesh. That's amazing. And I said, what? And she said, that's what your daughter told me that it was published in Bangladesh. I said, no, in Bulgaria. (laughs) At the end. (laughs) 
<laughs> and she said, well, she's very proud of you. And so, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see with her as she evolves, you know, becomes a teenager, if the conversations are easier for us to have, because even though we joke about my book a lot, she still doesn't want to talk to me about anything having to do with, you know, puberty or God forbid, I even say the word puberty. She's like, mom, <laughs> you know, it's gross, please. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, I don't know what it'll be, but I'm, I'm interested in it because I think, you know, the one thing I was always really clear with all my kids and the older kids um, was like, have sex with who you want to have sex with. Make sure it's consensual. Make sure you're safe and that you're always using condoms. And then that's it. You mm -hmm. know, I, I, I don't, I, there was really nothing more for me to say about it than that. I feel like I know they're having sex. I, yesterday I had to find something in my son's room. There are condoms all over the place. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm aware that this is happening. I'm not going to pretend it's not happening and I'm not going to pretend it's not happening under my roof. I just want to make sure that there's always respect for yourself, respect for the person that you are with and safety. And to me, if you check off all of those, that's huge because, you know, be a boy or a woman who, who, or who respects the people that you're with, who wants to take care of them, who knows, has enough respect for yourself that you're having sex because you like it, not because you feel you have to have it. And that's it. Then I feel like my, that my, my job is done. Um, and knowing what you know now, what would you go back and tell your teen or 20 something self about relationships or desire or sex? Mm, such a good question. Um, I think I would just tell myself to slow down you know, that you don't need to be married and, and, and tethered to another person when you're so young to give it more time and, and grow up just to let yourself grow up before you settle down. I was so hungry for a nuclear family. I had come from a, a, a long line of broken families, you know, dating back to my grandmother, my mother, my family, where my father died when I was very young. And I really wanted to be the, the nuclear family that broke the, the sort of awful spell that my family had had. And so I don't, you know, I, I, I loved my husband. We got along really well. We had some shared visions for the future, not, not all shared visions, but some. And I just thought I really did well for myself because I got myself a husband and I don't have to face the single scene. And it was a mistake. I needed to get to know myself. I needed to be not afraid of sitting with myself and of getting to know who I was and feeling empowered and strong and following my own path. And I, I just wish that I had recognized myself more, given myself more credit and also let myself fall. I never let myself fall. You know, it was always like finish line. You see the finish line, you're going for it. The finish line is a husband, babies, security, safety, uh, and that's that. And I never allowed myself to think about anything else except for that. And I, that's not what I want for my kids. My kids are, you know, I'm always like with them and with their friends, I say the opposite to them. Like when they, when they are like, oh my God, I can't believe that you were younger than we are now. When you guys started dating, I'm like, yeah, don't do what I did and have so much sex, sex with so many different kinds of people. Enjoy yourself, be free, be young. You know, someday you, you'll be settled down and it's going to be hard because there's a lot of compromise involved. So really just be, enjoy your freedom. If you can enjoy your freedom while you can. And, and I also talk a lot about monogamy with, with all my kids, which is to say, I don't necessarily think monogamy is for everybody. And that's just something that you need to know about and be open about and be honest about, because it, there's lots of different ways of living as long as you're being honest with whoever it is that you're engaged with. Sure. Um, now, last question. What advice would you give to someone listening who is newly or even not so newly separated mm -hmm. and they're thinking of dipping their toe back in to dating? Um, I would say, you know, give yourself a goal and give it a try. And the goal could really be, um, I'm going to go out on Saturday night. That could be the goal. And I'm going to try to talk to somebody for five minutes. It doesn't have, your goal does not have to be that you are going to go home and sleep with somebody. It, your goal does not have to be that you meet somebody who is going to be a potential future partner for you. It's just to, to go out and find out really what you want. And I would say, don't assume that you know what you want. Be open to the idea that you, you might change your mind. You might think you want one thing and discover that you want something totally different. So I think it's just about having the courage to show up and be seen. And I think that when you're single, 
and you're coming out of a marriage, whether it's a long marriage or short marriage, you feel very um, sort of ungrounded. You know, you feel like you don't even know who you are anymore because you would identify it as this person's wife um, or husband. And now you're and now you're on your own. And so ha- part of you is missing, you know, half of you is missing. But I think that if you can just say, I'm going to get to know somebody else better. I'm also going to get to know myself better. And that's really, that's where the power is, right? The power is inside of yourself. And I think that as soon as you can identify that and find what, wherever, however you feel that power for me, I found the power sexually, um, by having sex with people. It wasn't promiscuity. It was me really getting to know myself and know my, my own power. And so I think if you approach it that way, instead of having a goal, like I'm going to meet someone, I'm going to hook up with somebody. The goal is just get out of your house. That's it. That's all our goal has to be. Just get out. And then anything can happen. Step by step. That's what, that's what it takes, isn't it? Um, yep. Laura, a massive thank you for joining me today. It has been so good to talk to you. Uh, the paperback edition of Available is out now, but where can we find you online? Oh, thank you. Um, I'm on Instagram uh, at Laura Friedman Williams, and I love to hear from people. It makes me so happy to uh, connect with other women or men who have been through similar situations or different, but are still finding themselves. So um, I always let people know if they if they send me a message, I'll, I'll always read it and I'll always write back. Um, and I also do a lot of writing sh- of shorter pieces on Medium, so I can be found there also at Laura Friedman Williams. I write a lot about parenting and divorce and dating and all that. Well, not so much dating lately because it's COVID. So I have honestly, it's been it's been kind of rather a dry spell. But um, I write about divorce and marriage and parenting a lot on um, on Medium, and I'm on Twitter and uh, Facebook. I don't do Facebook and Twitter that much. I like Instagram better, but that's that's where I am. Excellent. Thank you so much, Laura. It has been so good to chat. Thank you. And to you too. I appreciate your having me on. Mm-hmm.